Hello, my name is Marilyn Sylvia, and I'm the outreach nurse at Polk Health Care Plan. And today we're going to discuss diabetes management. Um, and also, I am going to go over all the the agenda of what diabetes is. And we also have a nutrition educator, uh, Whitney Fung, that will also be working and, and letting you know about the nutrition. Uh, also, we do have classes with Polk Health Care Plan. We do two classes a month throughout the county. That is totally free. And just check our website because we go all over the county and the sites vary, so check it out. Anyway, today on the agenda, we're going to talk about what actually diabetes is, and we're going to talk about the treatment and management of diabetes, and then we're going to get into the nutrition and diet and um, play a game that's healthy challenge, and also talk about how important physical activity is with diabetes. So let's get started with statistics. Diabetes is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. In 2010, 25.8 million people in the United States were diagnosed with diabetes. About 14.2% right here in Polk County are diabetic. The interesting fact about diabetes is it seems like it's just kind of a new thing and kind of just started, but actually diabetes has been around since uh, ancient Greece and Egypt, uh, so it's, it's very, very old. And insulin's only been around since 1922. So we'll get started and talk about what is diabetes. First of all, glucose comes from the carbohydrates that you eat. And carbohydrates is the foods that you take in. And most everything has carbohydrates in it except protein and fats. So what happens is uh, glucose is what our cells use in our body to make energy. Um, and insulin is made by the pancreas. And that carries the glucose into the bloodstream, into your cells. Uh, you have to have the insulin is kind of like a key that unlocks the door to the cells and allows that glucose to get in there. And we need that glucose to, to create energy for our body. Everybody needs that to survive. So with diabetes, either your pancreas can no longer make the insulin or the insulin just isn't working properly in your body. And then you get the buildup of glucose. So again, the glucose is the main the body's main source of fuel, and it, the glucose is released into the cells by the insulin. And with diabetes, you're unable to control the glucose levels, and that'll make your blood sugars go way up or way down. Now, there's, there's different types of diabetes. There's type 1 diabetes, diabetes which is insulin-dependent diabetes. That used to be called juvenile diabetes, brittle diabetes. Uh, that usually is a person that's less than 30 years old has that. Not always, but usually. Um, that's where the pancreas is not working at all, and insulin is required. You have to take the insulin to live, to survive. Now, type 2 insulin is insulin resistant. Um, that's the most common type of diabetes. And that they used to call adult onset diabetes. And that's where the pancreas just isn't making enough insulin or the insulin just isn't working correctly in the body. And then there's uh, a gestational diabetes, which usually takes place during pregnancy. It'll usually go away after the baby's born, but the chances of it returning when that woman gets older are pretty high. So we're going to talk a little bit about risk factors of diabetes. Hereditary is the biggest risk factor, um, over being overweight, stress, a sedentary lifestyle, your age, and your ethnic background are all risk factors. American Indians, Latinos, Hispanic, African American and Asians are mo at most risk. Now there's a lot of myths out there about diabetes and a lot of people say things that are myths. Like, oh, you can catch that from somebody. You can't catch diabetes from anybody. 
um, or oh you can you can wash that away just drink a lot of water and it'll go away again that's a myth um, eating too much sugar will cause diabetes that again uh, isn't true if your insulin in your body is working correctly then eating too much sugar wouldn't do it because your body would normally regulate it it would only be that way if you were already you know diabetic or you can have a touch of sugar that's not true either you can't just have a touch of sugar and also um, there's a myth that there's no cure for diabetes or that there is a cure for diabetes. The truth is there is not a cure right now, but there are ways to control it and treat it. So we're going to start with hyperglycemia. And that means there's too much sugar in your system, too much of the glucose. And the causes of that are if you're eating too much, taking in too much food, or you're not getting enough medication, or sometimes other medications can bring it on, like taking steroids or cyphotropic type drugs. Those will, can also make your blood sugars rise. Uh, family history is big. Uh, stress, frequent illnesses and infections. Uh, you're, again, the sedentary lifestyle if you're just not getting enough exercise. Or sometimes your pancreas is just worn out and you have like a, a leaky liver or you're insulin resistant and obesity. Now with hyperglycemia the onset of the symptoms are kind of slow and sometimes people aren't even aware that they have diabetes. Uh, some of the symptoms are they uh, increase thirst, your mouth might be really really dry, you have frequent urination, you feel tired and drowsy, you may be a little bit hungry all the time or have a little bit of nausea. Uh, wounds that just don't heal right, they're very, very slow to heal. Your vision can be affected, you might have some blurred vision. Women tend to get frequent yeast infections. Uh, your skin can come, become dry and itchy or you may have an unexpected weight loss and also numbness in your feet and hands and frequent infections. Those are all symptoms. Now we're going to talk about the opposite which is hypoglycemia and that's when your blood sugars are very very low and these symptoms come on rapidly and can be very serious. Uh, you have the excessive sweating, kind of a rapid heartbeat, you might be trembly, headache, anxious and irritable, kind of dizzy and your vision is impaired. Uh, again, you could be hungry with the hypoglycemia also, and a weakness and a fatigue, and personality changes, just not your normal self. Now, the causes and the treatment for hypoglycemia are, the causes are if you're skipping meals, or you're getting too much medication, or too much exercise, uh, the treatment Whenever you're feeling those symptoms of the hypoglycemia, you need to right away check your blood sugar with the glucose meter. And if it's below 70, you want to take 15 grams of carbohydrates. And then you would check your blood glucose again in 15 minutes. You don't want to, when your blood sugars drop very low, you don't want to really eat a whole lot of food and take way too many carbohydrates in because then you have the peak effect. You're going to be taking all that in and then your blood sugars are going to be way high and then you have to go and you just don't want the peaks. You want to keep everything kind of level. So that's why it's important to only take 15 grams of carbohydrates and we'll talk in a minute about what, what you would take. Um, also of course if a person's unconscious you want to call 911. And they have these shots called glucagon that's available by the physician too when your blood sugars drop really low that you can take to help get your blood sugars elevated. You want to, um, you're, we talked about the blood sugars and what you want to eat, the 15 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, you can take, they have these glucose tablets now that you can get from like Walmart or the pharmacies and uh, they're just like little tablets that you can just chew and those will help raise your blood sugars or you can drink a half 
a glass of regular soda. Make sure it's not diet because you, at that time, you really want to get the carbohydrates in your system. So a half a glass is all you need or even a half a glass of orange juice or juice. And uh, candy's good too, lifesavers or something. You want to chew them though because you want it to get into your system fast. Jelly beans are good. Maybe an eight ounces glass of milk or you can even take with you like those little cake gel uh, things and just squirt those in your mouth. Those are good. You don't want to use chocolate because chocolate kind of slows down the, the absorption so it wouldn't work as fast because it, chocolate has fat in it. So you want to take something that's going to work really fast to get your sh blood sugars brought back up. Now prevention of, of hypoglycemia is to eat three meals a day Always, you want to maybe space them throughout the day and try to be consistent when you're eating your meals. And sometimes your doctor may even want you to have snacks in between. You'd want to check with your doctor to see how many times they would want you to eat, but at least three meals a day. You want to carry emergency carbohydrates with you at all times because you never know when this is going to happen. And uh, you want to make sure you're prepared. You want to check your blood glucose and call your doctor if your blood sugars are dropping below 70 often. You know, you want to need to let them know that because you're going to have to get your meds adjusted. And be consistent regarding taking your medications and eating. Make sure that you try to keep the same every day. We're going to talk a little bit about how you diagnose uh, diabetes and what your glucose would have to be. A person without diabetes, when you check your glucose levels, an eight-hour fasting blood glucose should be between 70 and 99. Or a random blood glucose, that means at any time, whether you've had food or not, you would want that to be between 70 and 139. And that, uh, that would be a hemoglobin A1C test that they do at the doctors, would be between 4 and 5.6%. And then with prediabetes, which is kind of your, your blood sugars are starting to not be normal, so you're kind of getting into that diabetes phase, but you're not quite completely diabetic. Uh, a fasting blood sugar for prediabetes would be between 100 and 125 fasting and 140 to 199 random, and that would be an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Now, to diagnose diabetes, they would do two of the fasting blood sugars, and so anything fasting over 120, 126 or two random blood sugars over 200 would pretty much be diabetic, or sometimes they'll do one of each. And, and also they may do more extensive tests, like if you had an abnormal glucose tolerance test or if your hemoglobin A1C is, is above 6.5. Now, the goals for a diabetic with your blood glucose levels, the American Diabetic Association, and this is their recommended goal, and it may be different from your doctor, so you would want to check and see what your doctor actually wants you to be at. But um, a fasting blood sugar before meals should be between 70 and 130. Two hours after meals, below 180 or uh, the criteria for a diagnosis of, of prediabetes, like we said, like I said, is eight hours fasting would be under 126, or a random glucose at 140 to 199, or a bedtime blood glucose from 100 to 140. Now the thing about diabetes, uh, it's just not good to ignore it. You can't leave it uncontrolled because Diabetes affects all the organs, so many organs in your body. Uh, if you leave it go, you're going to have eye damage that could lead to blindness. You could have kidney damage that may lead to dialysis. Heart disease, heart attacks and strokes, that's the number one leading cause of death with people with diabetes. Now, smoking can double your risk of heart attack and strokes. So if you're diabetic and you're smoking, that should be your number one priority goal is to quit smoking. And they do have the Florida Quit Line that you can look up and uh, they can give you free nicotine patches, diet counseling and weight management and everything. So it's very, very good place to look. Aspirin can help decrease your risk of heart 
heart disease, but you want to make sure that you check with your doctor that it's okay that you take an aspirin every day. And also neuropathy can lead to amputations and um, gum disease is very big with diabetes too. Now we'll go on with the treatment for diabetes. Number one is a healthy diet and uh, Whitney will get into that a little bit with the nutrition. Exercise is very important. You want to make sure that you keep all your doctor's appointments, take your medications as ordered, self-monitor your blood glucose, reduce stress, stop smoking. You want to make sure that you carry your emergency ID on you at all times. You also want to check your feet daily. Um, being diabetic, you know, you're prone to neuropathy and uh, since you don't heal well, it's very important that you check your feet and check them over every day for sores or cuts and make sure that you're keeping an eye on it so you don't get an infection. You want to wear socks that breathe, uh, that absorb the sweat, cotton socks. And you want to avoid lines on the bottom of your socks where it could rub on the bottom of your foot and make a sore. Uh, don't ever go barefooted. Uh, don't wear flip-flops and you shouldn't soak your feet. Okay, we're gonna get into the uh, blood glucose monitoring. The best time to check your blood glucose levels are before a meal or two hours after a meal. And you should record in a log and give that to your doctor when you go in. Just keep track of what your blood sugars are and it's a good idea to write down what you've eaten and stuff too so you know what will make your blood sugars go up or down. It's just really good. Uh, you want to learn how to set your monitor and you want to call your doctor if your blood sugars are consistently below 70 milligrams or over 200. Now checkups, when you, when you go for your checkups, it's the ABCs of diabetes. You want to make sure that you get your hemoglobin A1C checked and the hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that they do at the doctor's office and they can tell by that test what your blood sugars have been over a two to three month period. So it's, it's very accurate and very good to know. Your goal would be below 7%. You want to get that done twice a year or every three months depending on what your doctor says and, and how your blood sugars have been. Uh, you want to get your blood pressure at each office visit that you go and you want to make sure that your blood pressure is 130 over 80 or below and your cholesterol you want to get that checked every year too. So those three things. And also when you go to the doctor being diabetic you should uh, make sure that you get a flu shot every year and you want to keep up on all the vaccinations make sure that you have everything that you need. Uh, you want to see a dentist twice a year, check your feet like I said, and um, you may want to even see a podiatrist because it's really important when you cut your toenails too that you get those straight across. You, you don't want to cut down into the skin and risk getting an ingrown toenail which could lead to losing your foot. So, And also a dilated eye exam every year is very important because they can look and see if there's any damage from the diabetes with that. Uh, the glucose monitor machines, of course, are the machines that you use to measure your blood glucose levels. Sometimes you want to check with your insurance and see which meter that your insurance will cover because you want to go with that because the test strips may be more expensive. So if you get your, what your insurance covers, it'll be cheaper for you. But if you don't have any insurance whatsoever, there's places like Walmart has the Rely On, which is a very good meter and it's affordable. And also Winn-Dixie has some meters too. So just look around and you can find one. The best place when you check your blood glucose, you want to check on your fingers. Um, it's less painful if you poke on the side of your finger instead of right in the middle. And uh, you want to make sure that you rotate your sights. Don't keep poking in the same finger every single day. Rotate them around. And um, on the meter itself, every meter has a 1-800 number. If your meter isn't working right or if you have any questions, just look at that number there and you can call them. It's very important before you check your blood sugars, always you want to wash your hands because whatever is on your hands is going to show up on that meter 
if, if you were making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you didn't wash your hands, you're going to have a, a really high blood sugar and it's not going to be accurate. So just make sure that you do that. Um, and if you're having trouble getting a good blood flow, wash your hands with some warm water. And then kind of just dangle your hands down at the side and that, that'll help get the blood in there. Um, you want to check your meter. Every month there's a solution that comes with it. And just to make sure that the meter is working proper, properly and in the, in the range that it's supposed to be. Every meter has that. And after open, the, the test strips and the solution can only be used for three months. So make sure that you mark that so you'll know when it does expire. Um, let's talk a little bit about medications. There's different medications for diabetes. Some are oral. Uh, some work in the pancreas, others in the small intestine, liver, and the muscle cells. And today there's a lot of combination drugs that kind of work in different areas. And your doctor will know which is the best for you. Uh, insulin is the oldest and the most effective treatment of injectable drugs. And uh, they have also other injectables that decrease or suppress the glycogon secretion that your doctor may want you to use too. So let's talk a little bit about insulin because that's pretty important. Uh, when you get your insulin and it's in a vial, you want to make sure that you keep it in a clean and dry place, somewhere where it's not too hot or not too cold. Always look at the bottle, make sure that the expiration date that it hasn't expired when you're opening a new bottle. And um, once that bottle is opened, you can keep that bottle out. You don't have to keep it in the refrigerator, and you can use that within 30 days. And actually, you want to do that because the, the warmer insulin, the one that's left out, isn't as painful to inject as one that you would have in the refrigerator. But now all the other extra bottles you do want to keep in the refrigerator until you're ready to use them. Uh, you want to look at that bottle, too, and make sure that there's no clumps or anything floating. If there is, definitely don't use it. Take it back to your pharmacy. You never want to shake the bottle. You want to kind of roll it gently between your hands. Uh, you don't want to get any air bubbles or anything in there. And um, the sites, when you go to inject the insulin, uh, you can go around the abdomen, kind of an inch out, anywhere around that circle there. Uh, and actually, if you do inject in the abdomen, that works the fastest, that gets into your system the fastest. You can also uh, inject outside upper arms, the front or the sides of your thighs, or even in the buttocks. But the thighs and the buttocks is going to be a slower absorption, so it's not going to get there as fast. Now, the higher the needle gauge, the smaller the needle. And you want to um, place used syringes in a sharps container. And that's free with the county. You can go to the county health department or the fire department. And you just go in and tell them you need a sharps container. They'll give you one. It's, when it's full, you just take it back. And they'll, give, they'll take it for you and give you an, an empty, another new empty one. So it's really a, a good deal. Now, during sick days, you have to be really careful being diabetic. You want to make sure that you're taking all your medications as usual. You may need to check your blood sugars more often, maybe like every two to four hours. Um, you may need to check your urine ketones uh, if you're type 1 every four hours. And if you're type 2, if your glucose is above 300, you want to check with your doctor on that. And um, also, before you take any over-the-counter cold medications, you want to make sure you check with your doctor or your pharmacist because a lot of those will have sugar in them. So you want to make sure that it's compatible. Uh, stick to your regular meal plan if you can. You want to take 15 grams of carbohydrates every one to two hours. You can also include liquid carbs if you're having trouble eating regular meals. And make sure that you drink water at least every hour. Um, if your blood sugars are a little high, if they're like over 150, you want to avoid the sugary types of foods. Now, when you're sick, you should call your doctor if you have a fever of over 101 or 
if you've had a low-grade fever for two days, if you're vomiting and you have diarrhea for more than six hours, you want to let your doctor know, if your ketones are moderate or high, and if your blood glucose is over 240, and if your chest hurts or you're having trouble breathing, if you have like a fruity breath, or your tongue and your lips are dry and cracked, make sure that you contact your, your doctor. Um, before you get sick, you should always prepare, have a sick day plan. You want to list all your medications, including over-the-counter medications. Uh, have your doctor's phone numbers available, especially if they have weekend or holiday hours. You want to make sure that that's listed. And, and have your family or your friends check, make sure that they check in on you often. So being diabetic, you need to make goals for yourself because you're the one in charge and it's up to you to take care of yourself. So you need to make the goals and um, you should make sure that you're checking your blood glucose every day. Uh, your cholesterol, you want to get that checked like I said annually. Stop smoking, lose weight, and keep track of your blood sugars. That's all I have for now. Whitney will be next, and she will discuss the nutrition part of this class. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Whitney Fung, and I'm the Family and Consumer Sciences agent at the University of Florida IFAS Extension Office, and I also work for the Indigent Healthcare Division. Today, I'll talk to you a little bit about nutrition and how to eat healthy and why it's important for diabetics. So nutrition, why is it important? It's important for diabetics because it'll help you control your blood sugar. You, don't, you definitely don't want to let your blood sugar peak or go low, so it's very important to focus on the diet and focus on the foods that, <clears throat> that will help you control your blood sugar. It's also important to eat healthy to manage your weight. So we want to do things like prevent obesity and just maintain your weight so that you'll stay healthy throughout the rest of your life. So when we talk about diabetic diet, what really is a diabetic diet? It's something that's low in fat and calories, high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So really, everybody should have a diabetic diet. Um, it's, we want to focus on things to eat more of those fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that today. It's also a healthy eating plan. They're just general ways of eating healthy. You really don't want to feel guilty or you, know, you don't want to feel bad about not eating healthy that day. Uh, it's just reminding yourself of little steps and little changes that you can make to pat yourself on the back and say you had a healthy diet that day. It's also a disease prevention tool. Like Marilyn said before, there are, there are lots of leading causes of death. We want to be able to eat a healthy diet and th in those ways we can prevent getting different types of diseases like heart disease or um, having high cholesterol or other types of complications for your health. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the food groups. And we kind of heard a lot about the five main food groups and the different types of foods in them, but we're gonna break it down differently uh, into these three main groups. And the first one is protein, and those are things like your meats, your beans, and your dairy. Dairy like the, uh, the milk, yogurts, and cheeses. Uh, the second group are carbohydrates, and when we talk about carbohydrates, these are very, very important for diabetics, and we'll explain that in a little bit, uh, because these affect your blood sugar, but these are things that are grains, so your rices, your, your pasta, your breads, uh, and also vegetables and fruits have carbohydrates as well. And the last group are fats, and we hear about fats, but we'll talk a little bit more about what it comes from and what we want to try to limit and reduce. Okay, so protein. When we're talking about protein, why is it important for your body? So it's very important because they're building blocks for your body and they help make your body healthy, sustain yourself, keep yourself strong. Uh, you need protein for things like your muscles, your hair, your skin, as well as your body function. So different things going on in your body, it needs for enzymes and hormones to keep yourself running. And right here it says about 10% of your calories, and that means 10% of your calories that you eat in one whole day should come from proteins. So 10% is really is not that much. So that means that when you're putting the steak on the plate, you want to rethink because that might be more than 10% of your calories that day. And again, these come from foods like meats, beans, 
dairy, eggs, tofu, and things like that. So uh, if you don't want to eat meat that day, you can also get it from different types of sources as well. So if you, if you want to have beans or tofu, those are good meat substitutes as well. And most proteins have zero carbohydrates. So when we're talking about meats, and we want to focus on lean meats, um, and seafood and poultry, those things have zero carbohydrate. But what then, when you're talking about when you're eating beans, those have carbs. So you just want to keep in mind that when you're eating proteins, and we'll talk about counting carbs a little later on, that protein have no carbs, but beans have carbohydrates. And uh, you want to focus on proteins, meats, and things like that that are low or no fat. Um, so if you like things like bacon or things like that, you know, choose. It's you don't have to cut it out, but you know, try to eat it less often. Use those as treats. Um, and then if you're cooking meats at home and you see any visible fat, cut it off because you don't want that going in your body. And also choose plant sources for less fat and more fiber. So on those days where you know it, it'll even help you save some money, where you know you don't have to eat meat, eat those meat substitutes. Have some beans or drink a glass of milk. Um, or even try things like tofu, and you'll get more, um, you'll get the protein that you need, and even less fat. Okay, so carbohydrates. Like Marilyn said, carbohydrates are the primary source of energy for your body. Your body prefers to use carbohydrates as the fuel for your body. Um, so about 45% to 65% of your calories, so about half of what you eat in a day, should really come from carbohydrates. So when you're, you know, when you, if you're asking, uh, so as a diabetic, why is it important not to eat carbohydrates or avoid those types of things, you still need carbohydrates because your body needs to run. The only difference is that for a diabetic is that you need to spread out your carbohydrates throughout the day and still get that in your diet, but then not dump it all in your system at one time because that'll affect your blood sugar. The carbohydrates will go in your blood and it can either peak up high if you eat too much or it can go down low if you don't eat enough. So definitely you need to make sure you're getting your carbohydrates but you're spreading it across your meals and also talk to your doctor or dietitian for recommendations. Your dietitian is able to uh, plan out your meals, tell you how many carbohydrates that you need in every single meal uh, throughout the day. And these things, like we said before, come from breads, cereals, grains, pasta, rice, beans, lentils, uh, fruits and vegetables, dairies, sugar, desserts. So basically everything has carbohydrates except for what we said earlier, meats. Uh, so just keep that in mind that lots of things have carbohydrates. And we'll talk a little bit more about reading the label because that's how you'll be able to tell how many carbohydrates are in the things that you eat. And here on the bottom, I do have uh, it kind of explaining that carbohydrates, when you eat them, those are called saccharides. So when you eat saccharides, they are pretty much sugar. And when it goes in your body, it gets broken down into glucose, and it goes straight into your bloodstream. So like Marilyn said, if you don't have insulin or it's not working correctly, the glucose is not going to go in your body and be used for energy. So that's why your blood sugar will peak or go down low. And, and what we want to do here is when we have a healthy diet or watch your carbs, you'll able to balance out the blood sugar and hopefully not peak or decrease. So definitely it's very important for diabetics to count your carbohydrates. Next is fiber. Fiber is very important and if you've heard of lots of things of the benefits for your health, it's true because um, fiber can help you lower your cholesterol and also promote bowel movement and regularity and prevents constipation. Um, so eating different things like oats and barley, fruits, legumes, or um, grains, those things are very important. And also it provides lots of antioxidants and nutrients. Um, so when you're looking at the fruits and vegetables and things like that, and they tell you to eat a variety of them, it's because different foods have different types of nutrients and vitamins. And you want to eat a colorful diet so you can get that all in your body and you get the nutrients that you need. And you can get things from fiber to get fiber from things like we said before and there's a list of sources on the bottom. And focusing on those whole wheat flour and wheat brands. So the whole grains that you can eat which has lots of fiber are things like the wheat bread, uh, brown rice, wild rice, uh, whole wheat pastas and things like that. 
Um, so definitely try to increase fiber. And if you've even heard of eating things like more oatmeal or Cheerios can lower your cholesterol, that's because of the fiber. And the, the whole wheat fiber in there can lower your cholesterol. Okay, so next is fats. Um, fats we kind of uh, associate with kind of bad things and, and you know very fatty foods. Well, we actually need fat in your body. So you need fat uh, for normal body function and you even need it for sometimes uh, to absorb the different vitamins that you're eating in your diet. The only thing is that yes, fat is has the most calories um, compared to the other food groups. So fats, we have to be very careful of how much we eat because our body also produces our own types of fats and produces cholesterol. So we have to be careful of how much we eat and then the, what they want to do, what they recommend is to eat the healthier fats. So if you've heard of things like changing the type of oil, eating more olive oil, canola oil, or eating a handful of nuts, that's because those are good fats and um, good fats are the unsaturated fats and those can increase your good cholesterol and decrease your bad cholesterol. Um, and so they say that you should have about less than 30% of your calories should come from fats. And there are specific different types of fats and we'll talk just right here um, on the slide. So avoid trans fats. So if you've heard of trans fats, those are kind of, uh, there's a negative connotation with them. Um, and you can find trans fats in things like fried fast foods, baked goods, shortenings. So if you're at um, a, a store and you're buying things like pastries or desserts and things like that, lots of times they do have trans fats. So try to look at the label and try not to eat too much trans fat or avoid them if you can at all. Uh, limiting saturated fats to less than 10% of your cal calories per day. Saturated fats come from things like ice cream, cheese, meat, butter and different types of processed foods. So if you're eating things from a box, most likely it will have some type of saturated fat, but the thing is we have to limit it to less than 10% of what you eat in a day. So just be care very careful. Not, I'm not saying you can't eat ice cream, just be careful of how much you eat. You know, just have the serving size or have a small bowl. Everything in moderation and um, in portion control how much you eat. And then eat more of those healthy fats, so monounsaturated fats polyunsaturated fats. Um, like I said, it's olive oil, canola oil, choosing to the healthier oils, and then even things like avocado, nuts, and seeds. And rem but remember that these calories do come from these fats, so they are high in calories. So if you're going to eat nuts, eat a handful and not the whole jar. So just be very careful and um, watch how much you eat. Okay, so I hope you have seen this before. This is called my plate, and um, if you've heard of my pyramid before, this this image, my plate, replaced my pyramid in 2011 as the USDA government recommendation for every American to have a healthy diet. Uh, so my plate is a very simple image, and it basically tells you that your plates, your meals, your, your lunch and your dinner should look like my plate. So when you're looking down at, at your dinner, look at this and um, it should have a variety of all the food groups. And you can see that each food group is represented here. And there's main messages that my plate is telling you that about half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables and you can see here that it's portioned out half of the plates fruits and vegetables a quarter of the plate should be grains a quarter of the plate should be proteins and then to don't forget the dairy so if you portion control on your plate and you have all the food groups represented in your diet then most likely you'll get enough nutrients and vitamins that you need to stay healthy and prevent disease in the future um, so if um, you have that steak again, you know, it should not cover your entire plate. Um, and for a, for a diabetic, uh, it's very important uh, that you can follow also, because fruits ha are high in carbohydrates and high in sugar, um, that you can actually replace the fruit on the image and you could just add an extra portion of vegetables. So for a diabetic meal plan, for a diabetes meal planner, you can actually do half the plate vegetables and then your grains and your proteins. Um, and that way you'll be eating less carbs and then you'll still be getting the fiber and your nutrients and vitamins. 
Okay, so just a, just a thought out there is uh, if you can just take a few minutes and uh, share with your partner. Think about the meals that you've had this week, maybe last night or yesterday for lunch. Think about uh, what you ate and, and, and pat yourself on the back for eating one healthy item. And then maybe think of the item that maybe wasn't so healthy. And then lastly is you can also think about maybe uh, how can you make that not so healthy item into a My Plate recommendation. So if you were uh, to say that you had a piece of bacon, how can you make the bacon healthier? So you can maybe, you can choose turkey bacon or you can choose a leaner protein such as chicken or pork um, that doesn't have the fat. So go ahead and share that with your, with a, a neighbor or a friend. Okay, uh, thanks for thinking of that. Uh, so we'll talk about dietary intake and how much you really need to eat. So lots of times you hear people talking about uh, how many carbs do I need, how many calories I need. Um, it's kind of hard. It depends on the person. Depends on your height, your weight, your gender, your activity, how active you are, and really your, your health condition. So you really should talk to your doctor or your dietitian for the amount of calories and carbohydrates that you need per meal. Um, and one, one idea is to have energy balance. And energy balance means that the energy in should be equal to the energy out. And what that means is the energy in is what you eat. So when you eat, it gives your body energy. So the energy in is basically your diet. And then the energy out is what you use. So it, when you laugh, when you walk, when you, when you, you know, do exercise, that's energy out. So any physical activity that you do, as well as how much your body needs, is the energy out. So then how much you eat and should be equal to how much your body needs and uses. So when that is equal to each other, then your weight and your energy is balanced and maintained. But when you eat too much and when you eat more than your body needs, that's when you gain weight. Or you can balance it by maybe exercising more. Um, and then when you eat less than what your body needs, that's when you start to lose weight. And it's, it's said that about if you drop about 500 calories per day, um, and you'll lose about a pound a week. So be very careful. You know, calculate um, how many calories you need per day. And then that way you can maintain uh, your weight or even lose, uh, lose weight if you do need. Uh, and you can find out how many calories you need. Uh, you can call us for the handout uh, at the extension office or you can go to the website choosemyplate.gov and calculate how many calories you do need. And one last thing on how much you eat is also understanding portion size versus serving size. So portion size is how much I serve myself, the portion that I give myself and, and put on my plate. Serving size is usually the approximate size per, per unit of an item. So it's a standard amount. So if you look at the boxes, it'll give you serving size, and it's already calculated. It's about a cup or you know eight ounces. It's that specific serving that's already calculated. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because we have to realize how much we do eat. Um, serving size is about the, the average recommended amount um, per serving that you eat, but then if you eat the whole box, my, my portion will be five servings when, it, you know, when I might be eating a little bit too much. So keep in mind of how much you serve yourself and um, how much is on the label for that specific item. And how often should you eat? Marilyn touched a little bit uh, on this. and. Um, you know, we, we had said, you know, eat throughout the day. You don't want to skip meals, and you want to try to be consistent throughout the day. Talk to your doctor and dietitian again. Um, if they can plan meals out for you, and, you know, if you're the type of person that, that needs specific, um, you know, guidelines for each meal, talk to them and, and ask them how many carbs per meal and how often you should eat, uh, especially if you're on medications or insulin. And then count your carbohydrates. Um, that way, when you count your carbohydrates, you can stay consistent for each meal. Um, so you're eating, you know, 60 grams for lunch, 60 grams for, for dinner, and then 40 grams for breakfast, or, or whatnot. You can plan it around your meals, your snacks, and don't forget that drinks and, um, thing, and drinks and things like that are carbs as well. So you need to make sure you keep in mind when you're eating and drinking. Um, and then, like Marilyn said, make sure you keep those emergency candies um, 
or glucose around um, in case you need, uh, in case your blood sugar gets too low um, and you might need it if you didn't eat enough that day. Uh, so what to avoid in your diet? We kind of mentioned it earlier, um, but these are things that you know we want to be very careful of. Um, we didn't talk too much about sodium, but sodium is very important because the average American eats too much sodium in our food. Um, and uh, these are a list of things that are high in sodium. So we have cold cuts and cured meats, so things like salami, pepperoni, um, breads and rolls, uh, pizza. Pizza because it has bread and the tomato sauce. Tomato sauce often has a lot of sodium. And then you top it off with the salami and pepperoni. So pizza has lots of sodium. Soups. The canned soups are very, very tricky. Um, if you go to the, the store and you go to the aisle, there's heart healthy, there's low sodium, there's low fat, there's you know home style. So soups are very tricky and the, the important thing is that you go to the label and you read to see which one has the lowest amount of sodium. And a lot of times if you look for the little red label, that's American Heart Association um, Heart Healthy, uh, that can kind of guide you to uh, something that's lower in sodium content. Uh, sandwiches, again, it has the breads and then your cold cuts. So then together it might have a lot of sodium. And then poultry, it's kind of a tricky one because, you know, if it's fresh poultry, why really should there be sodium? Um, well, uh, this is kind of to warn you of the frozen types of poultry that you might buy. and. Um, Sometimes the frozen types uh, will be injected with um, sodium uh, just to, you know, could be make it heavier or, or uh, things like that. So be very careful. Look at the labels and make sure that there's no sodium if you do buy the frozen chickens. And then also to avoid the high fat foods. Again, you know, um, you can treat yourself sometimes because if you, if you just uh, don't allow yourself to eat certain things, you're going to crave it and you're going to binge. So try not to do that. We want to, you know, limit and reduce um, and just pat yourself on the back when you do um, do something healthy. So again, the high fat foods and the things that we want to try to avoid and limit are saturated fats, trans fats, and cholesterol. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the Nutrition Facts panel and how to look at that um, when you're at the store because um, this is the way that you can tell how, how the nutritional value for each item. And it's different for each item and even in different brands. It could be the same food, but a different brand or a different, you know, Type of uh, type of line uh, can be healthier or maybe not healthier. Uh, so it's definitely important to read these. We'll go through the each individually, but I'll go through kind of quickly the six steps for reading a nutrition facts panel. So this is a sample label for our macaroni and cheese, and we'll start here at number one. So first, you look at the serving size and the servings per container. So you want to see how much you know the serving is usually about. The, the amount that one person eats for a meal, you might eat two, but you know usually it's about one serving. And then the servings per container. So um, if you look at this, the servings for this entire box of macaroni and cheese is actually two cups because it's telling you that there's two cups in this box. But this label and everything that's calculated on it and the information is only for one serving. So you want to be sure that when you're looking at the label, if you are only eating one serving, then everything in the label applies. But if you're going to eat two servings, then you're going to have to double it or multiply it by however much you eat. So make sure you look at the serving and how much you're eating. And number two, Check your calories. So we want to, again, like we said before, you want energy balance. You don't want to be eating too many calories, more than you need, because then, that, then you can gain weight. So look at the amount of calories per serving and then the calories that come from fat. So here you can see that 110 of the calories of the 250, so almost half, come from fat. Number three is to limit these nutrients. Um, they're not always color-coded, but um, here it's color-coded so you can see. Um, the yellow ones are the things that, through research, the government has found that Americans eat too much of. And we've talked about these total fat, cholesterol, and sodium. So you want to try to limit and, and be very careful of these nutrients. Number four, get enough of these nutrients. So the ones in blue are, again, in research, they found Americans did not have enough of in their diet. 
So try to increase those, choose foods that have high amounts of these. Um, number five is the footnote, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to that slide. But it's the same on every single label, and it's there for your reference. Number six is the quick guide uh, to percent daily value. So 5% or less is low. 20% or more is high. So it's just a quick guide. If you see five or less, that's a low in an item. 20 or more, that's high in an item. And the percent daily value is here on the right column. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But um, that kind of gives you the reference of how much you need to eat per day, whether it's a maximum um, or a limit that you want to keep under 100% or something that you want to definitely want to get there. Um, so you want to get 100% of your vitamin C um, in that day. So we'll talk just in a second. But the most important for a label and for a diabetic is to look at total carbohydrate. And that's going to that's gonna be what applies to you most. So looking at the serving size and then looking at the total carb. Because you want to know if you eat one cup of macaroni and cheese, how many carbs are you eating in that serving? Or if you eat two cups, how many carbs? So make sure you look at the total carbohydrate line. OK, so for serving size, what happens if you eat two cups? That means that you're going to have to double everything on the label because this, this label has only the information for the one serving size, which is one cup. So how many calories if you eat two cups? So again, you'll have to double it which means that if you ate two cups, you would be eating 500 calories. So limiting and reducing, again, these are the specific nutrients that we want to limit and reduce. And the daily value are the recommendations for key ingredients based on a 2,000 calorie diet. So we'll look here at, at the sodium level. And sodium level, it says 470 milligrams, and that's 20% of the daily value. So according to recommendations for these specific nutrients, it's been calculated based on a 2,000 calorie diet of how much of each you're supposed to eat. So 20% means that you've already eaten, if you eat one cup of macaroni, you've already consumed 20% of what you're supposed to or allowed to have for sodium levels. So for the rest of your foods, you, you only really have 80%. So just being careful, being mindful, looking at the percent daily value. A lot of times, you know, you could see here 12G, 3G, uh, 30 milligrams. Um, and those stand for grams or milligrams. And that's kind of hard to remember, um, you know, how many grams of fat and how many milligrams. So when you look at the percent daily value, it's very helpful because you want to stay within the 100% range. You want to, um, you, can, you can reduce as much of the bad things, um, you know, as fat and things like that, um, as close you want to reduce as much as you can, but then for the good things like calcium, you want to be as close to 100% as you can because you want to get enough of those. So getting enough of these, but of course, watch out for your, for your sugars. And then the footnote. So if you're at the store and you forget, you know, you want to you wanna think of, oh, well, how much fat am I, supposed to, am I allowed to have? Or how much fiber am I supposed to have? Well, this little footnote, which is on every single label, is there for you as a reference. So if you want to see, oh, well, how much fiber do I need per day? You can just look right there and either, depending on how much you need to eat, based on a 2,000 or 2,500 calorie diet, Oh, well, you need 25 grams of fiber or 30 grams of fiber per day. So you want to aim to get enough of fiber that day because that's a good thing. Whereas the other things you can see here, less than, less than, less than, those are things that you want to be careful. Um, that, that's, so that's the maximum limit that it's allowing you. So based on a 2,000 calorie diet, and we'll look down the, the column, uh, you want to you want to shoot for having less than 65 grams of total fat, less than 20 grams of saturated fat, less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol, and so on. Um, and we can look at the percent daily value by kind of following that. Um, and it'll kind of help you calculate you know, how much that you're getting per day. And again, the quick guide, 20% or more is high, 5% or less is low. And remember that because it's important for the next slide. So 20% or more is high, 5% or less is low.
So I'm going to test you uh, on this quick question. Uh, for this piece of sausage pizza, if we were to have one serving, which is four ounces, um, which ingredients are considered high on this label? Well, if you said saturated fat and calcium, then you are correct because saturated fat and technically total fat as well, but you want to look at the ones that are above 20% um, and those were saturated fat and calcium. So this is high in a, in a technically a bad thing, something that's recommended to limit and, some, and high in a good thing because calcium we need for our bones and for growth and strength. Um, so is this a good choice? If something is high in a bad item, and high in a good item? Well, it really depends. Um, you know, if you were to say uh, you wanted, if you really wanted to eat that sausage pizza, then, then maybe, you know, that could be your freebie. But if you look at this, serving size four ounces, servings per container is six. That means that you're eating one, one sixth of the pizza. So that might be the small little pizza and a small little slice. So is it worth it to eat 33% of saturated fat for one tiny slice of pizza? Maybe, um, but I wouldn't be full off that one slice. So if you were to choose maybe a healthier option, it would be something that would be lower in saturated fat and maybe just as much as calcium. So looking at the labels, you can compare the nutritional value and then you can choose the healthier option by by learning how to read the nutrition label, and that's why it's so important. Okay, so we're gonna get to um, carbohydrate counting. Um, so why is it important? It helps you keep track of the amount of ca carbohydrates eaten at meals, uh, and your snacks, and your drinks. So then um, you can remember, okay, I ate this much, this much, and you can actually tell your doctor that this is how many carbs I ate to see if that helps in controlling your blood glucose keeping your carbohydrate intake consistent from day to day. And like we said before, you know, if you, uh, it's a balancing act. A lot of times, you know, if you're diabetic, um, you might say your blood sugar peaks or it might go down a little bit too much. It's really a balance. We want to avoid it from peaking and going down. And by, do, by having a healthy diet and keeping your carbs consistent kind of helps your body regulate it um, as much as possible. So if you eat the same amount of carbs for for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day, it really helps your body recognize and control um, your diet and, and um, everything that you put in. And then if you are on insulin injections, you might have to match those uh, with the carbohydrate intake, and I would talk to your doctor about that. Okay, so there's basically two different ways of carbohydrate counting. Um, one way is to look at the food exchanges or the servings. And um, there's books, if you've gotten handouts, um, there's just different exchanges. And a lot of times people like counting servings instead of specific number of grams. So servings would be, um, I can have four servings of a specific item or four different items for a meal. Um, so you just kind of exchange and you count the uh, group as a serving instead of counting the specific grams. And then the other one is the gram method. You're looking at um, the number. So when we're looking at the label and total carb number, you're looking at that specific number and then you're counting those. Um, so it really is up to your preference and it, it's kind of similar, you'll see. Um, so when we look at um, servings, um, each serving is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. Um, so in fruits, grains, and the milk group, uh, if you talk about servings, then it's about a cup of milk or a slice of bread or, or a, piece, a small piece of fruit. So it could be a small banana or a small apple or small, a medium, uh, uh, small fruit. Um, so, and then um, when you're eating non-starchy vegetables, and, and talking back about the MyPlate, um, the diabetes meal planner, um, the reason why they say to, if you want to take out the fruit and add an extra serving uh, or an extra portion of vegetable is because vegetables have less carbohydrates than fruit because fruits have a lot of sugar. So when you can have more vegetables, sometimes it's a good way to trick your mind. You can have more and, but then still stay within your carbohydrate range. And three 
non-starchy vegetables are one carb toys. So um, it could be um, three separate, uh, three half cups of lettuce or spinach or things or tomatoes, things like that. Um, so you get to have three vegetable choices just for one choice, uh, and one choice could be the fruit. So does that make sense to you? So you kind of have a, a larger portion of vegetables instead of your fruit portion. And then um, the exchange as well, like I said, it's one slice of bread or a cup of milk, small banana or a tablespoon of sugar. And if you want any handouts that kind of help you um, count your carbs, you can go ahead and call us or email us and we can give you those handouts. So this is just a quick little trivia and we'll just test your knowledge again. And um, so how many carbs are in the small banana? 15 grams, but you have to keep in mind if your banana is this big, then you know you're gonna have to accommodate for the number of grams. A slice of bread is how many grams of carb? 15 grams, and then a cup of milk, eight ounces, is how many carbs? Again, 15 grams. So don't forget, if your, cup, if your cups are you know, this big or you're getting a big gulp or something like that, you're going to have to increase that as well. So for this breakfast, it's total of 45 grams of carbs. Okay, and this is another one, and I'll just go through this one with you. So if you're gonna have a salad for dinner, a cup of romaine and a half a cup of grape tomatoes, that is 7.5 grams of carbs. So that's why it's, it's nice to have vegetables because there are less carbohydrates and less calories. But if you add dressing, don't forget to add those carbs as well. So a half a cup of zucchini is five grams of carb. And cooked vegetables are different than uncooked uh, leafy vegetables. So for the cooked vegetables, uh, a half a cup is five grams, uh, whereas it, you get a whole cup of vegetables for five grams, uh, one cup of raw vegetables for five grams. So you kind of get, uh, there's more carbs in less amount of cooked vegetables. A third a cup of rice is one serving of rice. That's 15 grams of carb. And then four ounces of fish. And remember how we said that protein and meats have zero carbs. So in this meal that you had, and if you can just notice it on one plate, and you can picture it if you were eating at your meal, um, you can easily start to count them. I mean, in the beginning, it's a little confusing, but once you have your plates, you'll be able to say, this is 15, this is 15, this is 15. Um, this dinner was 27.5 grams of carbohydrates. So really, that's not a lot because um, sometimes it's recommended, it's given a range, and it's specific to each person. So you really have to ask the dietitian or doctor. But there's a range, and it's about 45 to 60 grams of carb per meal for women and 60 to 75 grams of carb for men. So 27.5 grams for a meal really isn't that much. So you even have room for your drink, for the dressing, or even an extra half a third, you know, an extra serving of something else. Um, so like we said before, total, total carbohydrates are the most important. You're looking at total carbohydrate on the label. Um, but then there's two exception rules. And the first one is uh, when you're looking at fiber. So if something has more than five grams of fiber, um, you can just take those grams of fiber off. But it has to be more than five grams. And the reason is, is uh, that fi foods that are high in fiber are called uh, have something that's called low glycemic index. And some foods that have low glycemic index don't affect your blood sugar as much, or they affect your blood sugar in a longer duration of time. So then it, it doesn't, it won't make your blood sugar peak or drop down too low, whereas things like uh, fruits um, ha have high sugar content and can you know, affect, it can make your blood sugar peak um, and just kind of dump in, the glucose will just kind of dump in your blood and it'll affect your blood sugar. So when you focus on the high fiber foods, you'll get all those benefits as well as kind of like, it, it's kind of cheating the system because if you eat a high fiber item, you get to take all the grams of fiber off, um, but only if it's more than five grams. And the other rule is to look at uh, sugar alcohols, and it'll tell you on um, 
the label if it's a sugar alcohol or um, if it's you know a specific name that's listed here. Um, but sugar alcohols are just another type of sweet in there, um, and they're it's not completely like table sugar, but it's also not an artificial sweetener because they're not truly occurring. So a sugar alcohol will uh, it will affect your blood sugar, but not as much as table sugar. So the rule for sugar alcohols is you subtract half of the grams of sugar alcohols. So if there's 10 grams of sugar alcohols on the label, you would subtract 5 grams off of the total carbohydrate grams. Um, and that's because, you know, it could affect your blood sugar a little bit, but not that much. And here is a list of all the different types of sugar alcohols that's commonly used in your foods. And also, uh, calorie-free sweeteners do not affect your blood glucose. And these are things like Splenda, Nutrisweet, Equal, Stevia Trivia. So these things don't affect it, your blood sugar. Um, and that's why you can drink diet soda. And don't forget that when Marilyn said um, if your blood sugar is too low, that you need to have the half a cup of regular sugar because if you have diet soda, it's not going to have any effect. It's not going to help because it doesn't affect your blood sugar. So just remember the calorie-free sweeteners in the diet sodas don't affect your blood glucose. So other helpful hints just to remember, uh, eat at regular times. Again, don't skip your meals. Um, try, it's hard sometimes, but you know, try to have your you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner around the same time because your body is already trying to balance things out, work your body, keep your blood sugar, blood sugar levels um, you know, stable. Um, so if you eat at regular times, it, help, it definitely helps your body um, you know, regulate itself better. Don't skip meals. Exercise. Uh, Marilyn will just talk about exercise and the benefits in just a little bit. And then lastly is to keep detailed records. Sometimes it's helpful for you to write down everything that you ate, how much of each item, what you ate, and, and even the brand if you want, because maybe different brands might affect you differently. But you know, be very specific and keep detailed records. And then write down your, your blood sugar that day. So the next day you're feeling kind of funny or, you know, if your, your sugar levels are too high or too low or abnormal, you can look back and say, okay, well, maybe that's why. And then bring that to your doctor and, and show them or your dietitian and they can kind of work with you. Maybe there's things that you might have to avoid or, or be very careful of. Um, so just a couple of quick little things to practice on in counting your carbohydrates. Uh, here there's a pop tart and it's for one pastry and um, how many, I want you to tell me how many total carbohydrates if you eat one pastry of a pop tart. And that's 37 grams of carbohydrates and um, I think Marilyn mentioned uh, a snack size is generally around 15, so we want to remember that 15-15 rule like she said, but in when you're talking about your diet as well, it's around 15. Around 15 grams of carb is one serving, is one exchange, um, and, and it's around the recommendation for a snack size, 15 to 20 grams. Um, so 37 grams for one pastry of Pop-Tart is kind of a lot, so we're not saying you can't eat it, maybe break it in half uh, for a snack. And what about this fiber one bar? If you have one bar, how many total carbs are you eating? So this is the exception rule. You would have 29 minus 9 because there's more than 5 grams of fiber. So you just take that completely off. And if you eat one gram of fiber, one, one bar of the fiber one bar, then it's 20 grams of carbs. So, you know, if you're going to have a, uh, a snack, it might be more filling or satisfying to have a fiber one bar. And uh, here we have a can of black beans and the whole grain instant brown rice. So how many carbs would you be eating if you have that half a cup of black beans? That would be 15 grams because again, you would take 21 minus six, take all the, fiber, the grams of fiber off and you would be having 15 grams per, per serving of beans. And then for the whole grain instant brown rice, if you were to have one cup of rice prepared, how many carbs would you be eating? And that's 33 grams because the fiber rule is anything more than five grams and that's only two. So you have to count total carbohydrate, which is 33. 
So, you know, whole grains are good and, you know, eating brown rice is good, but we still have to choose those that are high, high in fiber. So, um, you know, look at things. Uh, so maybe the black beans might be a, a good choice for that day because it's, um, it's high, high in um, fiber and it has less carbs. So keep those in mind. Uh, just some tips for healthy cooking. Uh, use natural seasonings. So instead of adding salt to your food, uh, use things like garlic or use fresh herbs or lemon, things like that. Um, that's a good way to, to cut some calories and not even cut some salt as well. And again, you know, as a diabetic, uh, it's hard, you know, but you'll, you'll get the hang of it. You'll get, um, you'll learn and, and, and really it's okay. And don't think that you can't eat things that non-diabetics can't eat. You can still eat those same things. You just have to portion it out and, you know, regulate it throughout the day. Um, and find recipes of your favorite foods and apply the MyPlate recommendations. Um, go to my, choosemyplate.gov, look at the different things. There's lots of tips on there to check out. And so if your recipe calls for a cup of sugar, try to drop it a little bit. Um, maybe use three-fourths cup of sugar. Um, or if it asks for butter, Maybe try to use the, the tubbed margarines instead. A lot of times the tub margarines uh, don't have trans fats and are a little bit healthier than the stick butters. Um, and even salt, if it's asking for half a cup of salt, use a little bit less. Of course, it's trial and error, but your, your taste buds will adjust to the change. Um, use smaller plates. This is a good trick because it kind of tricks your brain, your mind. Um, when you're using a smaller plate, um, then you can go back and get seconds. Um, but then if you have a regular plate and you get seconds, you might start to be eating a little bit more and, and you know, eating more than you need. And lastly, it's plan your meals for the week around what's on sale at your market. Um, I only eat what's on sale. So go to your market, you know, see what's on sale that week, and then plan your meals around that. Look at the weekly ads online and, and just, you know, you can save money and eat healthy at the same time. And I just have a quick little thing for you to choose the healthy choice. Um, so looking at these two, two juices, which one is the healthier choice? It's the 100% fruit juice. So when you're drinking juices, um, be very careful because there's a lot of sugar. So you're gonna have to look at the label and look at the carbohydrates. Um, but if you do choose juice to drink, choose the 100% fruit juice because that means that it came 100% from a real fruit. Whereas things that don't say 100% fruit juice, you're pretty much drinking water and sugar. So um, it's okay sometimes to have those, of course, but you know we wanna choose the healthier option. Um, and then if anything, water it down with extra water or ice um, because there's a lot of sugar. Um, it could be even up to you know, 10 tablespoons for just a 12 ounce um, can of soda or something like that. So that's a lot of sugar. So which one is this healthier choice? It's the lean protein. So uh, it's recommended that we eat seafood twice a week and um, we choose the ones that are more lean with less fat. So on the right, uh, the one that has kind of visible fat, you wanna be trimming those off or choosing you know, the, leaner, the leaner cuts. Which one is the healthier choice for this? And the green one actually says skim fat free milk, if you can't see. And the answer is low fat dairy. So uh, whole milk has a lot of fat content um, and the whole milk, skim milk, 2% milk has all the same nutrients, has all the same um, vitamins and calcium as, as each other. So um, if you choose low fat or no fat dairy, you're getting the same amount of nutrients but less fat and one cup of whole milk has about 25% of your saturated fat per day. So if we follow recommendations and drink three glasses a day, you're consuming about 75% of saturated fat just in your milk. And we already get saturated fat from other things. So a good way, and the government recommends that we try to cut as much fat as we can by changing to 2% or fat free and it, it takes a while uh, whole milk is definitely diff you can taste a difference and some people say fat free tastes like water but you know if you slowly change um, one step at a time you can definitely do it and this is the last tip is um, which one is the healthier one it's kind of tricky but it's it's the way you cook it so looking at the way you cook it also affects you know kind of 
the way it's uh, if it's if it's better for you or not. And this one is the baked chicken instead of the fried chicken because frying foods you're frying it in oil. So then you know things uh, it's it's very yummy. And you know I mean I eat fried foods sometimes too, but you know we want to try to limit it as much as possible. So baking things, um, and there's lots of tips to bake it, and it tastes just like fried foods too. So look for those types of recipes. And of course for this baked chicken, um, there's a lot of skin on it, you know, being careful of those fat drippings in the gravy. Um, the skin um, is also high in fat. I usually, you know, will pe peel it off, and if I really want, I'll have a bite to cheat that day. And then just an a interesting fact for one chicken wing is about 8% of your daily value for saturated fat and cholesterol. One chicken wing because it's almost entirely um, skin, right? So I don't eat one chicken wing. I can eat many. So if you're eating chicken wings, um, you might be eating a lot of uh, saturated fat and cholesterol. But it's okay, again, you know, for those, for those special occasions. Just try not to eat it, you know, all the time. Okay, well that's all I have for nutrition and diet, uh, thank you. And Marilyn will talk just a little bit about physical activity. We're going to talk about physical activity and how important it is. Being diabetic, you should definitely have some physical activity in your life. It does so much for you. It, it helps lower your blood glucose levels. It helps reduce stress. It improves your heart flow, your blood flow and your heart health. It helps you maintain your weight, and it helps prevent diseases, and it gives you more energy. You just feel so much better, so it's a win-win situation. The best kind of exercises to do is aerobic exercises, and that's like walking, bicycling, swimming. You could even join a class and, and do you know uh, Zumba or any of those kind of classes. Um, excellent for you. Anyway, you want to start slow. You don't want to get too carried away because if you start out and you want to just go crazy, then you do it and then you get tired and you say, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. So it's very good to, to kind of limit your time and maybe if you're going to walk, walk five to ten minutes a day or in five to ten minute increments when you're starting out and just increase it every week. Um, there's this other program called the 10,000 Step Program, and we have handouts, and if you would like to have a handout, just give, give me a call. At the end, it'll tell you or, or my number, and I can send you one of those pamphlets. But it, it's a great walking program, too. You, you want to try the fast walking would be an excellent source, too. You, you want to do 30 to 45 minutes at least five times a week, or five days a week. That's very good. Swimming is excellent, and like I said, the exercise classes are great. Uh, before you start, you want to make sure that you're well hydrated. It's very important. And if you need to drink in, while you're walking and exercising, you need to do that. And of course, afterwards, too. Being diabetic, you want to make sure you check your blood sugars before and after. And you may even want to check in between if you're if you're exercising over 45 minutes. The precautionary measures would be you want to make sure that you check with your doctor before you do any exercise. Go over it with them and, and see just how much they want you to do. Uh, check your blood sugars before you exercise and ex after you exercise. The thing about um, exercise is when you do exercise, your blood sugars are going to drop, but it might not even be till the next day. So make sure that if you are exercising that you do check your blood sugars today and tomorrow to make sure that they're not going to go way down. You want to wear comfortable clothes, something that you can move freely in, nothing tight or constricting. Um, make sure that you have emergency carbs on hand in case your blood sugars do drop too, too low. And of course, if you're having any pain, you need to stop exercising right away. You don't need to lift, do any heavy lifting, just avoid that. Carry emergency ID on you at all times, because you never know. And uh, that's pretty much it, just have a good time, have fun, and just keep at it. Well, this concludes our class on diabetes management. Uh, my name is Marilyn Sylvia again, and on this page here, there's information. You can either email me or Whitney 
Our emails are there and our phone numbers with any questions, concerns, or if you just want to talk about diabetes or anything, just give us a call. Um, thank you so much for tuning into this class, and um, we're happy to be able to to do this. And I just wanted to remind you again, too, about the free diabetic classes that we have two a month that are out in the community. And you just need to check the website because we go all over the county and try to reach as many people as we can. So thank you very much.